Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome. Happy Monday. Hope you have a great week, or I guess today's Tuesday. Let me look at my schedule. Yeah, we start out on the 5th. Hope you had a great 4th of July weekend, and uh, you're back in Jeremiah. Uh, this is a follow-on, as you recall, from uh, chapter 42. The uh, Jews were um, staged, I guess, in Israel, ready to move into Egypt, and they turned to Jeremiah, and they asked Jeremiah to inquire of the Lord what they should do. Uh, the Lord's answer was, stay, don't flee, stay where you're at. Well, what we see in Jeremiah chapter 43 then was the response to God's direction. And I call this a chapter, uh, good theology, wrong duology. That is, they heard God's word, they understood God's word, they sought God's word, all the right things, but they didn't follow through and do God's word. So good or right theology, wrong duology. I've divided this up into basically two sections here. One is the rejection of the guidance in verses 1 through 7, and then the promise of wrath in verses 8 through 13. Uh, having been through Isaiah and been through Jeremiah, this is probably very familiar to you that God's word is rejected by his people and he brings wrath against them. It's a good lesson for us, I think, in the church. But before we get to that, let's take a look at this guidance being rejected in, verse, in chapter uh, 43, verses 1 through 7. We see, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, that um, some insolent men, or what's called in some translations arrogant men, stood up. Seems like the way it's presented here is almost before Jeremiah finished speaking and saying, telling them, don't flee, uh, you'll suffer God's wrath. These arrogant men, these insolent men, stood up and accused Jeremiah of lying. And they accused Baruch of leading Jeremiah astray. So it's Jeremiah and Baruch here. As you recall, Baruch is Jeremiah's uh, secretary and spokesman. Uh, they are apparently well known as pro-Babylonian in their outlook of things. Arrogant men are men who are presuming to speak in the place of God. Uh, men presuming to... Uh, stand up and say that the prophet of God is lying. Verses 7 to 8, we see all those who had gathered at Mizpah and then led to that staging area just outside Bethlehem are now led into Egypt. And they go to a town in the eastern delta of the Nile called Tapanes. Again, we've seen this before when the leaders of Israel are arrogant when they presume to speak for God or know better than God and lead the people astray, those leaders and the people suffer. We see this over and over again throughout the pages of the Old Testament, the historical books, the prophetic books, as the leaders, so the nation. Verses 8 through 13 then of this chapter is the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Look where Jeremiah is. is he is in Tapanes himself. He's been taken there with the Jews. I'm guessing he's either decided to go with them to continue to bring God's word to them, or he's been taken forcefully out of Israel and into Egypt. So here in these verses, they first attest to, in verses 8 to 10, what God warned them that they would do, that he is going to attest to that. And then verses 11 through 13 describe the wrath. So let's look at verses 8 to 10. Jeremiah does one of these uh, symbolic acting outs of what's going to happen. Uh, sometimes he speaks, sometimes God directs him to act it out. I think that gets in everyone's mind. Here he's directed to act it out by taking some stones, hiding them in a brick causeway that's leading to Pharaoh's palace in this city. So Topanese is a place where Pharaoh comes to rule. He's got a palace there and a throne. 
He's put these stones under the paveway leading to his throne, leading to his palace. And this is where Nebuchadnezzar is going to bring his throne and rule. This is where he's going to set himself up. He is going to come against Egypt is what he, uh, Jeremiah is saying or the Lord is saying through Jeremiah. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to reign there. The Jews can't escape. They can't escape their God. They can't escape his chastening when they disobey him. Verses 10 through 13 then describe what's going to happen. Describe the, uh, what's ha what's, uh, the judgment that's going to come upon him. Let me get a drink here. Getting a little dry. says that um, because the Jews have rejected his word, uh, he is going to set fire to the idols they worship in Egypt. And again, this is a kind of a continuous theme. You know, uh, God warns Israel, for example, not to go into an alliance with Egypt. Now, in the ancient Near East, when you entered into an alliance, you not only uh, depended politically or militarily on your ally, but you also depended on their gods and, in fact, worshiped their gods. So God is saying here, the God of Israel, he's saying he's going to set fire to those idols. He's going to burn them down. He's going to show that they are ineffective. He's going to take these Jews who have fled into Egypt against his word, and they are going to go into captivity. Again, there's no hiding here. You have to obey God's word or suffer the chastening. Then he says he's going to shatter the monuments to the sun gods. This is going to be another of these demonstrations uh, very clear that God is God overall. He's not going to tolerate these idols, but he's going to show his superiority by just tearing them down and uh, destroying them. So, again, in terms of application here, uh, chapter 42 was great theology. They received their revelation from God. Chapter 43 today, really poor duology. They're not willing to obey. And even today, uh, it's sad to say, and I'm sure you've experienced it and you've witnessed it yourself in your own life, uh, that God's word pursues us. Uh, God's word doesn't abandon us. No matter how far we run, he's relentless. He's relentless in giving us the truth, applying the truth to our conscience, and even using suffering to draw us back. I come back to Hebrews 12, 1 through 5 so often because I think it's really succinctly uh, summarizes the experience of Israel and what God also, the same God that chastened Israel, also chastens the church. In those verses, the writer of Hebrews warns the reader that the uh, God is a God who is a loving father, a caring father, uh, and any loving and caring father is going to chasten his children. They should expect it. And his chastening goes from uh, a reproof, it says, to scourging, uh, kind of a range of options that God has from a word of warning to severe punishment. And brothers and sisters, may you and I both heed God's word of reproof and miss and avoid his, his scourging, because he will bring it. But if we find ourselves even now in that scourging, may we take this opportunity to repent and return to that relationship that Christ is established between us and God, that relationship of peace, that relationship of reconciliation. Because he will welcome us back if we just confess our sins and admit to him our sins and turn, and he will reestablish that relationship with us. So wherever this finds you, whether it's just a word of warning or an invitation to turn back to the Lord, to stop the backsliding, I pray you to take action. I pray you to be cautious. God bless you, brothers and sisters. God bless you in your reading of the word of Jeremiah from the Lord.